where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? I mean, that was the question that was pondered during last Monday's Centering Prayer Session. We meet every Monday at noon. And um, we usually discuss theological topics most of the time, and, and this was one of them. This conversation was prompted by, at least in part, by Richard Rohr's daily meditation from Sunday and that Monday morning, and it tied nicely to my sermon from the day before, last Sunday, when I spoke on Romans chapter 7 and what Paul said about being puzzled by how, in spite of his desire to do otherwise, he often did the wrong or evil thing because of the influence of sin dwelling within him. Paul ended that passage on a high note, thanking God for his rescue from death by Jesus Christ our Lord. We can take much comfort in that word of hope. Jesus saves us from our sins. Praise the Lord. Where do you draw the line, though? How bad is too bad? On Thursday, if you heard in the news, a serial killer was arrested in New York City. What he's accused of doing is evil and despicable. Where do you draw the line on the reach of God's redemption? The Centering Prayer Group wrestled with this. Everyone knew what the answer was, but there was a candid admission among the participants of struggling to put that into practice or to accept it as including certain persons because of their heinous deeds. How bad is too bad? In last Sunday's meditation, Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest from New Mexico, says that everything belongs, meaning the good and the bad, and that we're all a mixture of good and evil. That squares well with what Paul says in Romans, but it's one thing to accept ourselves as this mixture of good and bad. It's quite another to accept all the other people with all of their bad stuff, especially certain persons. And yet that's what we're called to do. Jesus teaches us to love God and our neighbor as ourselves and even to love our enemies. The brilliant 20th century theologian Howard Thurman, whom, whose prayer was our benediction last week, affirmed that every person is a child of God. Well, if every one of us is a child of God, so is everyone else, right? Without exception. Thurman acknowledges, however, that the challenge we face with this proposition is something that he, he phrases this way. He says, Jesus approaches life from the point of view of God. The serious problem for him had to be, is the Roman a child of God? Remember, the Romans were the oppressors in Jesus' day in, in first century Palestine. Is my enemy God's child? Is, if he is, I must work upon myself until I am willing to bring him back into the family. Thurman even asked rhetorically whether it's possible that God doesn't really realize how terrible his enemy is although he quickly admits that God does. It reminds me of the story I've, I've told before, I think, of a woman and her grandmother. And the grandmother was a saintly woman. She was a very forgiving and religious soul. And they were sitting on their porch discussing a member of the family one day. And the young woman said, he's just no good. He's just no good. He's completely untrustworthy, not to mention lazy. Well, yes, he's bad, the grandmother said, as she rocked back and forth in a rocker. But Jesus loves him. I'm not so sure of that, the younger woman persisted. Oh, yes, assured the elderly lady. Jesus loves him. And she rocked, and she thought for a few more minutes, and then she added, of course, Jesus doesn't know him like we do. <laughs> Where do you draw the line? Today's scripture from, the chap from chapter 13 of Matthew that we heard Teresa read a few moments ago sheds light on what we're talking about here. Jesus was down by the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he was there to teach. But there were so many people who had come out that he got into a boat, and he was on the, on, the, on the lake itself while all the people stood on the shore. Back then, the teacher would sit, and all the people would stand. We've kind of reversed that, and you're probably glad of that today, right? <laughs> but such a large crowd was there, so they were all on the shore listening to him as he's on the boat. And, you know, Jesus often taught in parables, parables is a word that's a Greek word. It comes from parabole, which means to set side by side. In other words, they were comparisons, usually with the kingdom of heaven, to reveal what God's realm was like. Jesus drew from ordinary experiences of the people, activities they could relate to, and when used as a comparison with the kingdom of heaven, helped them visualize God's great vision for the world and for all people. These stories usually had a catch, though, a surprise that caught folks off guard, which 
also opened their hearts and their minds to deeper understanding and deeper meaning. Today's parable, as we heard, is about a farmer who sows seeds in his garden. Now, that definitely would have been something that they would have been very familiar with, easily relate to in their day-to-day -day lives. So in the story, as we heard, the farmer is casting out the seeds, and some of them fall onto the hard path, and the birds swoop down and eat them up right away. Other seeds that this farmer throws out, they land on rocky ground, and while they do start to grow, the, the soil is so shallow that when the sun comes out, it makes them wither and, and die. And then a third batch of seeds lands among thorns. Now, these apparently grow into nice plants, but eventually they're choked off by the thorns, and they too die. Finally, other seeds fall on good soil, and they bring forth grain, but not just a good harvest, which in Jesus' day, I've read, would be about 10 bushels for every bushel of seed, but a fantastic harvest, 30-fold, 60-fold, and even in some cases, 100-fold. I read that a 10-fold harvest in that day and time would have been considered truly abundant. And that 30-fold would have been considered what would have fed a whole village for the year. And a 100-fold, well, that would have sent the farmer into retirement. <laughs> so this was amazing. Now, there was the other part of the parable that we heard from several verses later in Matthew's gospel. It's an allegorical interpretation of the different kinds of soil onto which the seeds fell. And, and that can provide us with some very important lessons about our commitment to Christ, and I commend that to you. But today, I want to focus on the parable as told by Jesus as recorded in the first nine verses of chapter 13. I mean, after all, we don't refer to this, this story as the parable of the different kinds of soil, do we? What do we call it? The parable of the sower. In fact, the Bible even calls it that. In the second half, it refers back to the parable of the sower, that's how we know it too. So let's focus on that meaning. As I said, the people hearing Jesus tell this and other parables could relate to what he was saying. He was describing something that took place in their day-to-day -day lives. Many of them were farmers. And you and I, we can relate to this if we've ever planted a garden. How many of you have ever planted or worked in a garden? Let me see your hands. Okay, so lots of you know what gardening is like, right? And even if you've never gardened, you get the idea. There are some basics about gardening that you do, right? It's not too hard to picture. Basics would include you prepare the soil by tilling it, you clear it of weeds, and then maybe you fertilize it, right? Then, when it's time to plant, you carefully place the seeds in mounds of dirt or rows you form. Now, I know most of the time we buy seedlings nowadays, but if you have seeds, you want to be very careful. You want to know what you've planted. So you put down the seeds in rows, and you're very careful, and you don't want to waste those seeds. You're paying money for them. And, of course, you only plant in the good soil. Okay, now let's examine the planting method of the sower in the parable told by Jesus. What does he do? Does he carefully place the seeds in only good soil? No. He just slings seeds all over the place. I mean, he tosses some on the path where he must know there's little chance that they're going to grow. And then he throws some onto rocky soil, which also means very little likelihood that plants will thrive. And apparently he doesn't weed out the thorn bushes growing in his field. And then he tosses the seeds right into that area as well. And then, of course, knowing that the thorns are going to grow up and they're going to choke off his plants. In fact, it appears that three-fourths of his seeds he spreads in the garden won't likely amount to much of anything. And yet he keeps on slinging seeds everywhere. I mean, just picture him just walking around, just, just having a great old time, just throwing the seeds everywhere. The amazing thing, however, is that the few seeds, the one-fourth that do make their way into the good soil produce, an amazing crop, a harvest like nothing ever seen on earth, like something that could only come from heaven. Let anyone with ears listen, Jesus says. So what is the parable telling us that the kingdom of heaven is like? What's the comparison that's being made? What's the lesson with a catch? Well, with this being called the parable of the sower, it shows that the sower is wildly generous with the seeds that he throws onto the ground. I mean, he doesn't hold back, and he's not very careful about where he spreads all those seeds. He doesn't seem to care whether they land on good soil, where they're much more likely to take root and grow, versus bad soil that's shallow or rocky or prone to thorns that will choke off the plants that do grow there. It would seem, therefore, that the comparison is not just with the kingdom of heaven, but with God as the sower, with a capital S, of the seeds of grace and mercy. 
God showers such seed, seeds generously, abundantly upon all of us without caution, without holding back. God sends grace and mercy onto good soil as well as bad soil. In fact, based on the percentages of the seeds flung by the sower in this parable of good versus bad soil, you could say that God showers grace and mercy far more on bad targets than on good. Every now and then, I'm privileged to learn something really interesting about members of our congregation. This week, I met with Gene McCurry, and he shared something with me that got my attention and got my ad admiration for him, and I have his permission to share this with you now. A number of years ago, Gene and, his, and, and Jane McCurry's late son, Chad, landed in prison. He was there from December 2007 until November 2000. And 10. Jean and Jane visited their son almost every weekend. And back then, you were able to bring food into the prison, so they would do that, and they'd enjoy a meal with him, which was a real blessing that they could spend this time with him, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. After his release from prison, Chad spoke with Jean about how contact from the outside is so important to inmates and how much they really do appreciate receiving mail. To hear their names called during mail call is such a joy for those in prison. It means that someone cares about them, that they are not forgotten. Gene decided to act upon this newfound knowledge, and so after Chad is already out of prison, he started writing letters to inmates. I believe in the prison where Chad had been confined, and as you can imagine, there's a process you have to go through to write a prison inmate, and there's a whole thing. He sends them to a different address to get there and so forth and so on, but the point is, at first, he sent these individual letters, and he would receive replies, often with requests for things like devotionals. And he has continued this personal ministry for years now, for years. And over that time, it has really grown. I had no idea this was going on under our roof. He finally decided to send a newsletter to the inmates because the number of letter recipients grew so large. Right now, he has over 250 active inmates on his mailing list. Wow! But he gets better. Gene's a member of the Wesley Men's Bible class. Actually, he's their current president. And when members of that class learned that what Gene was doing, they wanted to support him. Now, frequently, inmates desire Bibles. The Wesley Men's Bible class has been helping Gene purchase Bibles for sending to prison inmates for a number of years now. If I followed what Gene told me, in late 2019, early 2020, Gene and the class purchased and sent more than 250 Bibles to prison inmates. And these are not just little teeny things. These are full Bibles, expensive Bibles. Last year, they sent 150. They've also sent devotionals, I believe, such as the Jesus Calling Daily Devotional. Thousands of dollars have been invested by Gene and the members of the Wesley Men's Bible class to this wonderful outreach ministry. And presently, Gene's letter ministry involves inmates in 20 prisons in North Carolina. It's amazing. Gene told me that he does this in memory of his late son, Chad. It certainly touched my heart to learn of this amazing and ongoing act of love in the name of Christ. To connect all of this with today's scripture and Jesus' parable of the sower, one might argue that given the high recidivism rate among prison inmates, spending the time and money to send letters to them is a big waste. I mean, they're in prison for a reason, and they're likely to return to a life of crime, so why make such an effort? Why throw good seeds to bad soil? Well, here's what I would say in response. First of all, these letters do make a difference. Of that, I am sure. But secondly, it does not matter one iota if many, if not most, of the letters end up not changing the lives of their recipients. The parable told by Jesus makes it clear that a positive rate of success is not the only factor to consider. It seems that what's really important to the sower who created heaven and earth and every one of us is to be generous with grace and mercy. Generosity of a degree that's mind-boggling. God doesn't seem bothered by all of our sins and shortcomings when deciding to share grace and mercy upon us. As I said, in fact, Based on the parable, it seems that much more grace is given to those portrayed as bad soil. God appears to care especially about those who have fallen short. 
It's to those whom God is constantly sending letters of love, not because they deserve it, not because they will likely respond in a favorable way, but because they need such grace and mercy and because God's love is abundant and unconditional. Maybe it's also because God never sees any soil as only bad. God always, always sees the good in everyone and everything. So let me close with this. The answer to the question. The answer to the question the centering group pondered, where do you draw the line, is that there is no line. There is no line. God loves all people, which means we are to love all people as well, and all means all. God's far-flung love has reached every one of us who claim the name of Jesus. And we're called, no, we're commanded to shower love on all others in Christ's name with the same unbridled generosity as has been shown to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.